All right, we're going to get this evening going. We will have a few giveaways throughout the evening, but I'd like to start things off. I'm Shelley Dunbar. I'm one of the new owners of Neptune Mountaineering. Thank you. My husband, Andrew, and I bought Neptune. Uh, it's going to be a year ago in just a few days. And one of the reasons we bought Neptune was to keep some of the traditions alive that Neptune is so well known for. Things like getting all the gear you need for whatever kind of trip you might be going on, whether it's some really you know, high altitude Everest expedition or just going to Shelf Road for the weekend camping and climbing. But one of the traditions that Neptune was really well known for were the, uh, the Thursday night events. And this tonight is such an amazing turnout. And why we did this event is to bring all of the community together to see and experience amazing people like Conrad Anker. And all throughout the year, we're going to have all kinds of amazing people coming through. So I hope you'll join us again. And I want to introduce to you Brady Robinson, who is the executive director of the Access Fund, a local nonprofit that um, well, he can tell you what they do, but of course you probably have heard of them. We hope you support them. Also, Protect Our Winters is here tonight, and we hope you support them as well. Thank you. So, without further ado, I'm going to bring Brady Robertson up, and he's going to tell you some things about Conrad. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. Shelly th and Andrew, thank you so much for hosting us, and thanks for, uh, it looks like you dumped a little bit of money into the place, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I run the Access Fund, as you all know, we're the organization that keeps climbing areas open and conserved. There's also people from the Boulder Climbing Community here, the local group. This community has been incredibly generous to us, and so I just want to say a big, huge thank you, and if you want to know more, you know where to find it. Also, protect our winners. They're based here in Boulder, Colorado now, too. So uh, welcome to the neighborhood, POW. How long has POW been in the neighborhood? One year. One year. All right, welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you, Conrad. All right, I'm going to introduce Conrad Anchor. Conrad, as you probably know, is one of the greatest American alpinists of all time. He's done a lot of incredible things. Probably the thing that puts you on the map was finding Mallory on Everest in 1999. Uh, he's done a lot of other stuff. The, the, the Meru film that just got handed off. Anybody see that? Maybe the, the most incredible climbing film of all time as well. And, uh, and, and now Antarctica and all kinds of things in between. You know, he's known a lot of triumphs and camaraderie. He's also known a lot of uh, some tragedy and some loss over the years. And what you might not know as much about Conrad is that he's actually a great humanitarian. He's got an enormous heart. And uh, along with Jenny Lowe, he founded the Kumbu Climbing School in honor yeah, that's where is a, a round of applause. In honor of his fallen friend in, uh, through the Alex Lowe Foundation. And they're giving Nepali climbers increased safety ma margins through uh, classes and training. And trying to make sure that they go into the hills with more than just their famous fitness and psych, but the skills to actually come back home to the village after they're done. So it's an incredible organization. I've had the opportunity to go on a few trips with Conrad over the years. Uh, we spent some quality time uh, in a portal edge high up on K7 Stormbound. And so I can tell you a little bit about his character. Conrad's the guy you want when the chips are down, when the food is running out, when everything looks hopeless and bleak. He's the first up, melting snow, telling jokes, keeping it light, keeping it in perspective keep the young bucks from totally freaking out, losing their shit. And, uh, and it's, an, yeah, it's, an, it's incredible. And so it's been one of my honors to be able to, to experience some of those things with Conrad. And, oh, okay. and maybe one of the other things is that even after all these years, he's 55, he had a heart attack, uh, uh, high up a wall in Nepal, nearly killed him. He still has a childlike enthusiasm for this stuff. He's not doing it for the glory. I'm sure he's really happy to come up here and talk to y'all, but that's not why he does it. He just totally loves climbing. He's really psyched. And uh, someone who maintains that psych over such a long period of time is incredibly rare. So it's uh, my honor to introduce to you and to welcome Boulder, Colorado, Conrad Anchor. 
Thank you, Brady. Yeah, we're going to toss out some swag there. Heads up. We get everyone going, get everyone psyched here. Woo! Yeah, thank you so much. Um, gosh, this is a, a treat. So, yeah, in the back, if we can turn the lights down just a little bit, we'll get things going here. And um, yesterday was uh, National Women in Sports Day, so if you didn't catch that, woo! Yeah. yeah. Women that participate in sports are healthier, happier. They're more, they're more stronger. They're they're more powerful. And Shelly, you embody that. So Neptune's is going to be a success because Shelly is a force of nature. So let's give it up for Shelly and Andrew. <laughs> Woo! Bringing Neptune back, which is a, a it's a real treat. So. Anyways, um, tonight's uh, nonprofit partner is Protect Our Winners. We did the Kumbu Climbing Center on Tuesday. And um, just to sort of set the stage on uh, the Kum or, uh, POW, Protect Our Winners, 10 years now, and it's a climate advocacy, and it's a way to get um, uh, the message out to the young generation, the millennials, that climate is something that takes care of. Because this is what was going on in 62 when Humble Energy was like, we're going to melt 7 million tons of glacier which we know we have a, a challenge here with CO2 and where um, this is and the, the overall and how it affects uh, the planet. And this um, little schematic here, 1887, 89, so every two years it clicks over. And this is a great uh, graphic from NASA on their uh, climate website there, where you can see how the, uh, the planet's heating up. 1934, so that's about when uh, my, my dad was around. He was a teenager at that point. This is the year I was born, 62. There we go, look at that. Um, in different places, it's cold up north, but watch as it changes. Obviously, the cold is uh, blue and warm is hot. So, 98, 2001. So, we are, um, we've got a real challenge ahead of us. And it um, sort of is our responsibility as people from the United States to address these, uh, the upside and the downside of. Uh, of a changing climate. These are images from Hurricane Sandy. You guys were all familiar with that and the um, sort of the challenges on that. So Boulder is a uh, hot spot for science, and particularly with climate and um, a lot of the, um, the areas that we have in there. So we can see in this dramatic, um, this, this graph here is where the, uh, the ice is moving out. And it's not close enough that you can't see it, but there's ribbons going out there and they, they correspond with what areas of Antarctica are getting warmer. So um, it's uh, one of these things that uh, is going to affect our, the, the planet. Um, Antarctica is the um, fifth largest continent. It's uh, home to 70% uh, of the world's fresh water and that's all tied up in 78% uh, of, of the world's glaciers. So it's about an average of uh, two uh, kilometers thick, the ice on there, and it places up to uh, three kilometers. And more of uh, science on here, this is uh, the speed of uh, glaciers in Greenland, and so this is sort of the, uh, the, the way that we're looking at it, and this is a, a pretty important part of um, how we want to uh, understand uh, the planet and what's going on with it. Yeah, a little prop to NASA there. We like NASA, they do good things. So, um, yeah, anyways, we need to um, be aware of this. And um, the way we do that is uh, paleoclimatology, so how we can look back in time and understand where that is. So Protect Our Winters is here in Boulder. It's there uh, moved up from uh, California. Some of the staff are here with us tonight, and a big shout out to them. So anyone that came to Tuesday night, thank you for uh, being dedicated and getting tickets to both nights. But this will be a different show from uh, Tuesday night. So this time it's 100% uh, about Antarctica. And um, this uh, image uh, from Google Earth gives you an idea where it is. I mentioned that it was the fifth largest continent, and it um, is a trove of uh, where we have all of our water. And the water that melts off of there drives the world's uh, ocean currents as they move around. Um, the circum-Antarctic current goes um, clockwise around this, and you can see that gap between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula with the Falklands and South Georgia moving out there. You can see that um, the, the, the plate tectonics and the effect of um, things going on, the map is as seen without water. A tremendous amount of lifestyle, uh, life in uh, Antarctica, but it's all on the coast. There's not much on the interior. The interior is a 
dry place. It's the coldest, um, highest, driest continent on it. And it's defined by ice. There's um, in every single form of it and in every different way of it. So before we jump into more current expeditions, we'll go back in time to um, what it was like in uh, the, the first explorers in here. So this is uh, Robert Falcon Scott when he got to the uh, South Pole. The Norwegians had beat them there uh, by a month, and they were absolutely destitute. Um, Scott and his five men perished on the way back, and it was uh, a real race to get to the pole. So it was kind of like going to the moon in 1967 that we did here in the United States and those really monumental points where you get out there. And they got to the South Pole and there was a tent with a Norwegian flag and inside there there was a letter that um, Amundsen, who was there first, had asked Scott to deliver to the King of Norway should they perish on the way back. And um, they didn't. And so it was this, um, this moment where they didn't make it in there, but um, one man that was part of this exploration, this history of all of it, was uh, Ernest Shackleton, otherwise known as the boss. And um, he'd been there in uh, 2000, I mean 1907 was his first trip, and he got to within 100 miles of the South Pole, realized he didn't have the endurance to make it there, turned back and brought all of his men uh, safe and sound. 1911, um, where the, the, the uh, South Pole was reached by the Norwegians and the British, um, successfully by the Norwegians and Amundsen his trip, a great example of uh, polar um, exploration and planning and everything like that. So Shackleton decided to come back and do the sit start to the South Pole. So to put it in uh, bouldering terms, make it more difficult. So um, he was going to walk across the continent, be dropped off on the Atlantic Ocean side from his ship that uh, had departed from South America, and then be picked up on the Pacific Ocean side on a ship that would depart uh, leave from uh, New Zealand. And so they went down, they got to uh, South Georgia eventually, and the whalers that were there had commented to Shackleton that it was the greatest amount of ice that they've had in a, um, in a long period of time and that it was unseasonably thick. But Shackleton and his men, um, all uh, 27 of them, it was a team of 28, they went on with the ice and eventually the Endurance, which was their wooden ship with a, uh, a coal-fired uh, motor that was probably um, 40 horsepower. I mean, uh, people go motor, uh, motor boating and water skiing with bigger motors now. And their, their ship was held fast in the ice and it was kind of pushed out like a cork and eventually the, um, everything was for naught because they were caught in the ice. They wintered over. The ship eventually um, was crushed and eaten by the ice and they offloaded their dogs and Shackleton and his men began this um, epic tale of survival. And for the next uh, 17 months, they sort of um, lived in their rowboats that they had. They pulled them on the ice, and eventually they were able to get to uh, South Georgia Island. Um, they'd been dropped off in the, where's the mouse? There we go. They were dropped off. They were held fast in the ice down here. The ice drifted around. They eventually made it to Elephant Island, and then from there had to um, get to South Georgia to effect a rescue. So Shackleton left with uh, three other men. There four of them were in a small 21-foot boat, and they sailed from uh, Elephant Island all the way to South Georgia, made it there, and effected a rescue. So the story of Shackleton is probably well known if you if you're not familiar with it. Um, Endurance is the book by. Alfred Lansing, it's a great read of uh, what humans can do. And although Shackleton's uh, a century ago, um, we think about what the Earth was like when it was his time and they were exploring, it was uh, vastly different. And the story of Shackleton is one that, um, if you have it in your mind, you can keep it close to your pocket. So whenever you think that things are getting really bad, like your cell phone dropped a call, or you didn't make your flight, or you got soy sauce on your shirt, or something like that, or someone cut you off, or um, something that's like a, a modern day um, tragedy or epic. Think about Shackleton. Those guys were fully uh, living on seals and, um, and fish for 17 months, and they pulled through. So it's one of these moments where Shackleton is looked to as a leader, and what made Shackleton shine was that when he was under duress in a very difficult place, he came to be able um, to draw onto that uh, that leadership, and that's part of what um, I believe is is in that same way.
So from the uh, story of Shackleton, which was uh, the early exploration there, um, on to uh, the Vincent and Tyree stories. And these are some images uh, courtesy of John Evans, who's um, from the area here. And he was part of the, the first expedition um, that took place in 1967 um, to go down and climb uh, the highest point in Antarctica. And this was a, a great trip. Nick Clinch was the leader of it. And this is the uh, Ellsworth Range, the Vincent area. They landed in with a, uh, a, a C-130 air transport plane and then offloaded um, everything into these gigantic sledges. So, and then they manhauled them. So <laughs> this is like, I love it. You know, they got the flag on the, on the end there. They just hauled the sleds across the, uh, so it's so cool it could be hipster. So <laughs> this is the next level in hipster backpacking. You're going to be... <laughs> I mean, these guys were, the, it was 67, but you can see the, uh, the climbing route that uh, these gentlemen had, and um, it was, was uh, the first ascent of the Vincent Massif, and um, it was a great trip. John is uh, an exceptional mountaineer, uh, visionary. He came back and um, climbed it again, um, close to the 50th anniversary with uh, many of the team members that he was with, and that was, uh, it was a good journey for him, and he's... Um, okay with me sharing these slides and so he's psyched that people get to learn about it but he imagined climbing in bunny boots which are the uh the closed cell air boots that the uh, uh were designed for the korean war and then using that with big frame packs and then check this out this is uh the climbing equipment so <laughs> if you carry enough wands together in a bundle they'll you can use them as an ice tool so um and then onwards but it was um Cutting edge climbing to be out there and t at this point and uh, really to, to see this is the Shin Vincent Cole and they were able to get up to uh, the sum summit of the Vincent Massif which uh, then became the high point of the uh, of uh, the seven summits and this is at the summit of Vincent and they put flags up of all the uh, treaty nations to the Antarctic Treaty which had been signed in uh, 1957 by in the International Geophysical Year. The team there at the summit, enjoying that, and then back down to uh, base camp. So Epperly, another one of the peaks here, they climbed the obvious line here. Um, can you spot the line? <laughs> um, we can see the climbers in there for scale, but um, for any of you ski mountaineers out here, this is the range to go to for skiing if you want uh, big ski descents. And so we'll have a little bit more on that. Um, Looking out from the summit of, uh, towards the summit of the of Vincent Massif and Tyree is the peak over to the, on the far right, that is the uh, second tallest peak in, in the range that was um, part of what these uh, gentlemen came to do. But the inclement weather, and then um, this is the, uh, the ridge on Tyree that um, John Evans and uh, Barry Corbett were able to climb. And it, um, if you, this climb that they did is pretty remarkable. It's, um, this skyline from the left, this is an aerial photograph where they came down to that knoll and then uh, went up onto it. So um, the two of them were heading off on their own to make the ascent of the second highest peak in Antarctica. Just fascinating. The rock here is quartzite, uh, which is a, a metamorphosed sandstone. And it, it's um, probably the closest approximation is in Big Cottonwood Canyon, Utah. So that's the same age and the same uh, geologic formation of that rock there onto the, the Vincent area. But these are um, some images that I added on to um, the presentation because it was all things Antarctica and places into that. So again, that ridge on the left there that uh, Tom and the got right after it. Barry Corbett and, pardon me, uh, John Evans. A lot of respect for these guys, our, the, the, the folks that came in before us. So um, we're going to drift through these. They're standing on the summit, ever so proud, and then off to uh, the north summit. And the landforms there. 
the aircraft that eventually came to pick them up with skis on it, and then the team there. So this is um, after they got back. And so they, um, three years ago at the American Alpine Club meeting, there was a panel discussion, and, and um, Nick Clinch, who has since passed away, was part of that. So if you'd like to listen to the podcast, you can see what these uh, gentlemen are up to when they headed out on that first uh, expedition to go in there. So the, um, before I get into Queen Maudland, which is the story that I'll share this evening from an expedition that I, this is the range I was in um, just previously in December, go back to um, the, uh, the range of, uh, of the Vincent Massif. So here's uh, John Krakauer, who was with us on Tuesday evening, and myself 21 years ago on uh, climbing on the rock and even. And the peak that this trip we set out to climb was in the far distance there on the right, and that's uh, Olvatana. So it was um, a journey for the two, um, my second time to be, come back down there. So, But um, from 92 to 2002, I worked on Vincent in the Vincent area, which is um, the, um, the seventh summit. So there was quite a draw for people to come in there. And on uh, one of the days that it was overcast and unable to fly, Anselm Baud, who was um, a um, ski guide and uh, ski mountaineer. We were both guiding at the same time on Vincent. He and I left. You can see the, the cloud level below. The, um, we were unable to fly, and so we went up and um, went to the west ice stream of, um, of, the, uh, of Mount Vincent, so it's sort of this big, large area. And it was uh, Anselm's 50th birthday, so we were, um, I was totally in awe that I didn't get to ski with him, but here we were with our plastic mountaineering boots, and um, it was a, one of those rare moments of life of something that's a, a good ski descent. So it was um, 2,000 meters at a constant 45, um, maybe 40, sometimes up to 50, but it was um, a real treat to be able to do something of that magnitude. And um, again, if adventure is what you like and ski mountaineering, the areas in um, in Antarctica, and particularly the Vincent, it's sort of a, a great skiing place to go. Frozen selfie before we had camera phones, but there's our ski line, the ski tracks coming down and um, through that, that narrow part on there. But um, it was nice in that it was this constant angle and it was, um, when, the, when the snow was good, it was uh, exceptionally good. But um, just kind of the, the view of the range, the type of rock that runs down the spine of it um, and it's one of the seven summits. People come in to uh, climb Vinson, and um, it, it's, it's kind of sometimes people come in and they take pride. I did it in eight days, and I did it the fastest, <laughs> the fastest trip, and I'm always like, you came that far, and, and that's what your takeaway is? So <laughs> if you're going to go down there and you're going to use the carbon to get there, make the most of it, um, and spend some time down there. And, tour around and visit and see what it is. So it's, um, it's a, a trip that um, if you're one of keen, if you're keen for it. This is uh, an ascent of Tyree that I did with uh, Alex Lowe. And uh, Alex was uh, a boulder uh, climber, an employee in the 80s. He worked here at Neptunes um, back in the day and was uh, my best friend in climbing compadre. And a lot of you guys know the backstory with Alex and I. and. Uh, Shisha Pangma and then with Jenny. Dave Hahn, who was, um, we were down there too, is also uh, out of Taos, New Mexico. Wonderful. But um, yeah, this was, we did the third ascent of um, Tyree and going up on the, uh, the backside. It's the second tallest peak in the continent of Antarctica and kind of the, the terrain that we encountered. More good skiing, although on this one we didn't carry the, uh, the skis along with it. This is a very, it feels very scientific and dry because on Tuesday night I had sort of like, here's my, how I got started, this is when I was a kid, this is Yosemite, um, silly things like that, but this is, um, but it was, it was nice to see the, um, you know, in, in an odd way, there was a, a food cache that was left by the uh, original ascent in 67, so we found this food cache in a wooden box and there was peanut butter and uh, beef mints, <laughs> chewing gum, um, a lot of things like that. And we took it up and we brought the stuff out and 
mailed some of it back to the original expedition members, and they were um, kind of psyched on that. One of the, um, the peaks that um, was, there's seven principal peaks in the Ellsworth Range, and there was one that uh, Erhard Luriton had climbed via a Kuar, and then this had a face that was in it, and was, um, I went up that solo without a rope, and, and I guess you can't, those things, they don't, they don't make for good stories, because you have like four shots, and you're like, there it was, I scared the shit out of myself. <laughs> I don't know why I did it, but it was, um, it was a, a good time. So it was sort of, um, when I was in Antarctica in those years, I was working um, as a guide. And so whenever the weather was bad and the clients couldn't come in, I would go climbing and, and do things. Jim Danini came down and visited us one time, of course, legend of all legends. Um, and then the uh, standard base camp that you have in, in Vincent area. So if you, if you are interested in this, um, ALE is the outfit that uh, does the logistics down there. And it's, um, it's an expensive place to go, but if um, you could spend your money different ways, and if, this is, if you want the experience of this, it's uh, probably a good place to go. So <laughs> Dave and I in our base camp, Back when I had more hair and one-piece suits were in vogue, <laughs> we just lived in these plastic bags that were basically one-piece suits, so, oh yeah, so we just got to keep the color theme going, but um, that's all with that. So there's um, the background to uh, this most recent trip, and this is uh, the one that um, we dreamed up together with Cedar Wright out of Boulder here. And um, so Jimmy Chin, Cedar, Alex Honnold, Anna Pfaff, Savannah Cummings, and Pablo Durana, we were the team that came down there. And we met um, Ivar Tolofsson here in the left, in the back, and um, he was uh, the first expedition there in 93, 94, and they climbed Ulvatana and the principal peaks there. And we were both in the same range in 96, 97. So we'd met 21 years ago. He's the same age as I am. He's out of, um, lives in Norway. Um, I pursued a life of climbing, so I sell sleeping bags. He became a real estate mogul. <laughs> and he has this really cool Airbnb place in Cape Town. <laughs> um, so it was like, okay. And, but he's been coming down there. He's, um, I love Ivar. He's like, well, you're climbing more. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but um, he's, it's nice to, to have that. Um, but instead of flying with uh, tons of... Uh, duffel bags, 25 duffel bags. We put it all on a pallet and we mailed, uh, air, air freighted it down there, which was a pretty good way to do it. You had to fill out a carnet. It was a little bit more work going into it, but it ended up being um, pretty uh, a good option on it. So Alex here getting, uh, we had to go into um, our gear there to get our rack out to go climbing in Cape Town before we eventually flew in on this, which is an, an Aleutian um, jet and a uh, four wing, um, four engine above the fuselage wing. So this is sort of like a, a stubby 747 that just can go anywhere and it's got a cargo hold in it. And this flies in from Cape Town, uh, South Africa into uh, the continent. So our, um, it's oh, about 16 and a half thousand euros for that flight and then you're another um, 10,000 euros for the other one. So it's not an inexpensive place to go. So we pitched it um, to North Face as our expedition. And this is um, Alex. So, of course, when the weather's bad, he had to work out. I was happy to go skiing and, and get blown about by the wind and kind of in that other um, end of things. But it was um, to go have this opportunity to come back here 21 years later with Cedar pictured here and then. Uh, Jimmy was um, sort of a, a a real treat. I never, I thought, okay, this is, uh, I, I, I don't particularly deserve it. <laughs> but um, anyhow, the um, the peak that uh, we set our sights on, uh, Ulvatana, which is the, um, the prominent peak here, and then the rest of the range um, in behind us here. So Jimmy and I climbed this over a two-week period, and then Cedar and Alex and Anna and Sav, they climbed all the other summits, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, Cedar and Alex did, I think, 14 or 15 summits. They climbed every single day, and so 
all the ones in the background, and um, it's called the wolf's jaw because it looks like a, a jaw, and this is the wolf's tooth. It's the prominent peak there. And so, but the type of climbing was different. One of them was wall climbing, overhanging, and once you commit to going slow, then you're hauling up your gear, you've got your stove, and then you've got your sleeping bag, and you're going to go slow. And Cedar and Alex, they would leave camp, and then we would go till they finished the climb. It didn't get dark. Um, they just came back. And they would climb with a 40-meter rope using uh, micro tractions and soloing. And so Alex, as we know, is um, probably the world's strongest trad climber. I mean, I, I don't know anyone else that soloed <laughs> free rider. So <laughs> that's about as trad as it gets, right? You solo El Cap. I think I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that, his skill level on that and Cedar and him of um, obviously with the supper fest and bicycling around in the desert towers are well suited uh, to each other to get that going. This is uh, Pablo Durana, so awesome guy, uh, Colombian, um, uh, lived, grew up in Canada, lives in the Bay Area, super strong climber, and Pablo was with us as um, part of our media team. So when these expeditions that we head out, they're product development trips, but also um, kind of branding is um, kind of what the goal is. So. Landing with the Twin Otter, same type of plane that uh, we came in with uh, 21 years ago. And these planes are built in the 60s, and they just keep them um, tuned up. So the route that Jimmy and I climbed, it went up this wall to that notch and then continued on the route. And the original route climbed the snow to there and then up through those weaknesses in 93. There's a route that climbs this left-hand skyline. And so it's about um, you know, 10 rope lengths to get on that section there, um, kind of the, the good part of it. So we brought yellow back. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it was a bright day out, but um, it was definitely Jimmy and I, kind of the old guy's route that um, we fixed uh, six ropes on it and then finished up and went off um, camping on, on the end of it. Uh, Anna taken skiing here with the uh, Tor and Odin, two of the peaks that were named after that um, Norse mythology, hanging out at camp, getting after the, um, the various peaks on there. It was um, a meaningful trip in that uh, I was, uh, had, didn't know if I still was physically capable to do it. Uh, Brady mentioned having a, a coronary incident, which I did, and I'll share a little bit of that in, in, in momentarily. But. Um, to be able to come back with this team and with Cedar and to share the experience I have with building out a base camp and getting things going, making sure the team's well, um, the logistics with it, um, a lot of those things that I really enjoy doing. It was good to take those, uh, those skills and, and that experience and share it with the next generation. Uh, Savannah's 25 and is a creative and loves taking pictures and she looks to do what Jimmy does in terms of uh, being able to appreciate and enjoy nature. So there's nothing better than building a big kitchen in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> feeding everyone. So I'm, I'm a parent at heart, and it was uh, nothing better than getting in the kitchen and making sure everyone's fed. And I mean, we all have those moments, right? That's why we get outdoors. Uh, Cedar crushing it here. So he's... Uh, going to be building a film on this. It'll come out next fall, probably in Real Rock, and uh, sort of highlighting it. Anna and Savannah, um, awesome to have those two along. Cedar and Anna and, and the Savannah, the four of them climbing um, on Holtana on a uh, one specific climb. And then looking back over to uh, Ulvatana, the, the wolf's tooth there in the northwest wall that we so this was uh, what Jimmy and I had some, um, it was all overhanging off width, so, but you couldn't really, you'd like free climb aid it, and it was just a miserable um, experience, but it was a lot of fun. So <laughs> we took a uh, number five and a number six cam, and we'd shuffle them up, and it was nice because we did a, a new route to the, where it connects onto the other route, and did it without placing pitons or placing bolts, and uh, trying to have as minimal impact on that route as we did. And it was nice because in the, in the time that we were there, we didn't place any bolts or any pitons. And so the Norwegians that I had introduced you to, 
they're very strict. And so the English relate them to being like Brits in the 70s, just totally draconian. And so, but they were like no bolts um, and as little hammering as possible. That was their ethic that they wanted to share there. And a lot of that comes from the troll wall up in Norway. And so it was kind of neat to, to go in there. Um, we did bring a, a drill down there, but we never used it, which was kind of a, a fun thing to, to do that and come back to it. And I mean, bolts definitely have their place, but they're, um, the, you, you go without them and it kind of makes the experience a little bit more better. Artwork, Alex <laughs> in his tent, he, he read a book a day he would eat Nutella out of the jar. <laughs> he adapted pretty well. He's the most, uh, one of the most phenomenal athletes that, that was in it. So, But um, yeah, one of the fun projects on this was uh, working with a design team at North Face. And we um, kind of looked at what we'd used in 21 years ago, which was a hard shell outfit, and then this time, knowing that the rock was abrasive, it would be better off with a, a soft shell type technology, and that's um, the layering system that we worked with them, and came out with it specifically, some of the stuff that's available here at Neptune's, the Summit Series, so there's the, uh, make you feel good about that. Jimmy chugging his way up the off wits, the, uh, the sun dog, here's our Abbey Road picture, I'm in the... <laughs> Back there, and Anna, um, Cedar, Savannah, Alex, and Jimmy, and uh, some of the spires. And so Cedar and Alex and Anna and Savannah, they went after all these climbs in the background. A lot of them are about a thousand feet in length. And whereas Jimmy and I were in the uh, the frozen chimneys and off widths, and just it was. Um, when it gets really cold, eventually you kind of adapt to it, so you don't have any way to, to go back and forth on it, and it, it becomes um, constant in that whole image. So now, the uh, looking down from the summit, these are Jimmy's pictures, and there's a reason why Jimmy does, um, he's a great photographer, these are all from Pablo and Jimmy, but looking down onto that ridge, our, our tent there, it was a, a continual challenge in uh, rope management. We had one 9-1 dynamic and one 9-millimeter static. And the rock was um, incredibly sharp. And was um, we had to take athletic tape and put um, Band-Aids on the rope. So if you're a wall climber or if you're out there and you get a nick, put a wrap of uh, athletic tape on right away. Um, it's a safety tr uh, trick. And so big mountain climbing. And, no rope is immune from that. So Jimmy and I on the summit of Ulvatana, selfie style. Jimmy was totally psyched, and there it was, um, the, the final pitch and standing on the summit. It was probably minus 20 and just blowing um, like it was uh, just absolutely crazy. It wasn't worked out OK. Well, that wraps up the. Um, Antarctic journey and visiting down there, being with uh, this most recent trip. And I'll kind of switch uh, stories here real quick before we do some Q&A and books and things like that. And um, this is David Lama, um, in a picture from 2015. And that's um, the uh, Lunag Re. And so it's a, the peak, the summit on the right had been climbed. The left summit hadn't been climbed. And so that um, is the highest peak uh, by permit in Nepal that's unclimbed. And so we had to go at it in um, 2015 and we're hoping to make it up. We ended up uh, pushing on um, at more than we, uh, more than it worked out. This is um, the time lapse and some images looking out, climbing it, helmet cams. And we got up to a high point. We thought, okay, we're gonna, um, we bypassed a really good campsite at about 3 in the afternoon, mistake number one. And then went up in about 8 o'clock at night. We started digging for a campsite. Didn't get our campsite in until um, probably midnight. And then woke up again at 5 a.m. and continued on. And the goal was, um, there's the summit. We got to um, just above the sun shade line there on that uh, the image that you can see on there on our, on our second day. And we realized it just wasn't in the cards and that we were going to uh, 
have to come back and um, have, a, um, have another go at it. Um, moving to the ice fall, this is the ice fall that we had to reverse. So we had to go at it, didn't make it up. That was 2015. And then 2016, I was like, okay, I'm going to come back. David and I were totally psyched for it. He's um, a, uh, an adept. I mean, yeah. He free climbs territory. He's badass. So, but um, and he grew up in Austria, and his father's a Sherpa. So, and I'm proud to have him as a member of the North Face athlete team. Kind of a new development. Yeah, David. But this is uh, we had another go at this, and I was um, determined to to have success on it. But um, the um, life is. Um, unexpected and um, a couple more of the images of climbing on this terrain here probably the most important piece of gear we had was a shovel so um, there's snow shovels behind me here but leading with a shovel using it as a nice tool um, this exposure if it had sun on it worked out well but if it wasn't um, if it didn't have sun on it uh, the northeasterly exposure the snow is typically really bad so but back to Nepal, 2016, uh, same time, the um, middle uh, first three weeks of November. So it's post-monsoon, it's dry, the wind is off it, but the days are short. Uh, you only have 11 hours a night, 13 hours of darkness um, to do it. But for David to, uh, to come back to the Kumbu, this was our second time up here together. His father's from Paflu and was a trekking guide and met his mother, Claudia. And um, so David... Um, was born in Austria and grew up, but he has this incredible network of cousins and second uncles and relatives and everyone loves him. So everywhere we went in every tea lodge, they'd be like, David, come on in here. So it was sort of the, the prodigal son. And it, um, it's great to see how he um, influences and motivates Nepali climbers as they see him as one of their own. And they when he's walking down the trail, you're like, oh, there's a Nepali. <laughs> so, because he is. But, um, so we came back 2016, and um, we um, were going at it our first day. We had um, bad weather initially coming in, then we caught a little bit of a cold, and then um, the election happened, which was unbelievable. We'd be sitting at a glacier up there and talking to my wife about, really? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say it caused me any more stress, but I was like, it was, um, it was pretty bizarre because I had no one to talk to. I mean, Je uh, Jenny would be five minutes on the sat phone and trying to explain to David, who's 25, the electoral college. So, <laughs> and he's like, well, in Austria, it, it's on Sunday. Everyone gets the day off and it's one person, one vote. What's this thing? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's dark, deep space. but. Anyways, we went up um, on the uh, 16th of November and uh, set out to go do it. And uh, at about um, six pitches up, I had uh, this intense pain in my chest. And I knew that it wasn't um, from altitude, because altitude has a slower onset, and it wasn't a sore tooth, or I didn't get clocked by a rock. And it was a, a heart attack. And I had never had a heart attack. I was not. Um, at risk, I, I don't live on bourbon and bacon. Um, I'm healthy, so I was, an, I was what the fuck? Um, <laughs> I'm having a heart attack. And so it's, um, luckily David and I right away were like, um, it wasn't something that was gonna go away in 15 minutes. So we rappelled off, um, called the helicopter in and hitched the ride with a helicopter that was delivering microwaves and rice and um, <clears throat> And they didn't know what to make of me. I didn't know what to make of myself. Um, but I can see in um, the left picture right in there, that this is where the occlusion was. And now this is um, where it has opened up. So um, an angioplasty is um, a stent going in. And this was um, in Kathmandu. And this is the, in, um, the, the, the coronary care unit with um, in Kathmandu. And so a wonderful team of doctors that were there, they were, um, um, they said, we need to operate immediately. And I had a stent put in for my right radial arm. And 
I was awake while it happened. It felt like a mouse ran across my chest, and then the, the pain was gone, and then they inflated a stent in there. And so spending time in a Nepali hospital, I'd um, never been in the hospital before. I hadn't, I'd uh, dislocated my left thumb, sprained my right ankle, and bit by a tick. And that was, <laughs> to get to age 53, that was the extent of my getting sick. I'd, I was like, okay, I'm gonna deck one of these days climbing, but I was, then this happened. But the uh, crazy thing was, is check out the size of that bed. <laughs> Nepalis aren't quite as big as the people in the United States. <laughs> the hospital beds in the US, you're in this big room and it's like a queen size bed and it goes up and down and there's vibration things. And, but um, this was just there in the hospital and they, um, immediate relief of uh, pain, but it was, um, it was amazing, this had happened. I didn't tell anyone, um, but Im immediately the, the Sherpa network came. Um, uh, all the, the family, these are the wives of some of the Sherpa that I work with in the mountains. They came to visit me and take me to the temple and bring me fresh fruit. Um, North Face, who I've been working with for 35 years, they flew Jennifer over to have her help out and um, make sure I was okay. Went to the Mayo Clinic and um, got, uh, uh, had, a, had a checkup on there. So I probably could have let it go and not uh, told anyone about it, but um, I tell uh, people about it because it, it happened and it's just another bizarre chapter in my life, but um, I'm always uh, thankful for it and thankful to my family, Jennifer, Isaac, Sam, and Max um, are sort of the, the what we all live for is being with our family and our community. So. Shout out Chris Noble, Chris Erickson, Gordon Wilsey, Galen Rowell, Jimmy Chin, any other photographers whose work I've had here, John Evans, I do appreciate you using um, the images up there on that. So we will, um, let's go to um, some, pardon me, we'll go turn out the lights and we'll get some, we'll go with uh, Q&A if you guys, a little bit of that. And then we have posters signing back there if you need to head out to your family. So. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, Boulder for having me here. Well, question there in the back. What's next? Um, first, Isaac graduating from university. So make that happen. Um, then, um, yeah, I'd like to, I'm not sure what the, uh, I'd like to go back to Lunog. I've been there twice, sometimes, I'm always like three times, but I don't know if that'll happen, but, <laughs> but mostly um, being here and um, uh, enjoying my work, being part of our climbing community. I'm 55, I don't need to go do the stuff I was doing in my 30s, so do want a trip a year, um, the work we do in, in Nepal. But um, yeah, there's, there's uh, being a, a, an engaged citizen in the coming years, I mean, all those things, so, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, how hard is it leaving the family? So, um, well, Jenny, and she's a saint, um, when, the week or two before we leave, there's separation anxiety that we both go through, and so we know how to, to work with that. Modern communication is great using a sat phone, um, so we're able to connect with that and through images. But um, some people are adventures, and so there's always been those people going back to prehistory, and we look at the, the odyssey of leaving home, having an adventure, unknown outcome, and then coming back, and that whole cycle is what we do. Every time we leave on a ski tour or we go climbing, we're doing that in a small way. And I think that draw is, is elemental and emotional. So, but we're, she accepts it, I accept it. We, um, we live in the moment. And so to say, oh, not to go climbing would be not to live or not to experience. Oh yeah, she, so if you watch the Meru film, she's got a couple moments in there where she's like, oh yeah, so. Well, look at this, someone dropped a picture off with, uh, I can't 
broadcast it, but <laughs> with Alex and some friends in front of uh, Mount Hunter <laughs> to LA Base Camp. A couple more questions, please, in the back. What are our dogs' names? We have Happy, Leroy, and Brown. And unfortunately, none of them are good crag dogs because I'm one of those guys that doesn't bring my dogs to the crag, and I don't like dogs at the crag, so sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I love my dogs, and I go running with them, and I play Frisbee, and we go swimming with them, but keep the church and state separate, so. <laughs> They dig pits at the base. They're, they can be a nuisance, and it's um, not everyone's in there. So it's um, and the uh, the rangers that did the work at City of Rock in Idaho came back, and that the impact of dogs is quite a bit uh, on there. So my apologies if I've upset someone's dog karma. <laughs> Other questions, please. What's my favorite climb? So. Well, if I was in Boulder <laughs> tomorrow and I had time, it would probably be uh, the Naked Edge. If I was in Yosemite, I'd probably be the Rostrum. But there's, um, I'm not, I don't think in like absolute, oh, it's the best climb or something in the past was the best experience. So there'll be a climb that'll happen tomorrow and as long as I'm climbing, it's good. And so there, there are a lot of really beautiful, wonderful climbs and they're all, they all have their place in time. So. Devil's Tower. How could you like say Devil's Tower is better than Yosemite or better than ice climbing? It, it just is, and it's really good stuff. So, yes, please. Something to tell my 20. I can't. I mean, I can minimize it in a, in a small way, but still, as a professional climber, doing what I do in a in an explorer and adventure, I've got a huge carbon footprint, and I'm aware of that. So, but how can we? We can live better on a on a day to day basis. Um, not eating meat is an easy step. So, if you're interested in um, ways we can look at that, Drawdown. Um, it's a great most recent book about uh, how we can look at the next 50 years and, and get things going. So, pick it up in the book form. It's twenty dollars. Uh, it's written by Paul Hawk, and if you get it on Kindle, it's a little bit hard to read. But the book form is great. And, drawdown. That's a good thing. So I try to do that and be an advocate. Um, I, we need to keep uh, you know, the places that we love, open space, and, and the things that we do. We need to make a, an investment in renewable energy. We need to keep coal in the ground. Let's keep use natural gas to generate electricity, and then eventually we'll be into renewable. And we got to, in our lifetime, we're going to live out, we're going to have plenty of comfort and plenty of carbon, but what's it going to be like 200 years, seven generations down the line? And that's where our nation, with our intellectual and the muscle that we have with science and technology, we need to be leaders in developing that and, that's, um, and collaborate with China. We can't let them win. We just got to work together and it's for the sake of a comfortable life. So two more questions, one in the way back, and then I'll get you. Yeah. My favorite book would be, um, gosh, I always be, my, my favorite book and favorite climb. I got to come up with like a steady, like a, an answer that would work with um, any one of them. But um, I sort of, um, the book that, whichever one that I happen to be reading, I'm rereading Wallace Stegner right now, um, his essays about the American West, which is really good. Um, but the, 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 com the complete works of Jack London, if I had to choose one favorite book to take on an expedition, although it's, it's you know, it was, it was like TV of their time, right? <laughs> it was just these sort of wild stories of Alaska, but they're always good fun. And last question with you. If I had anxiety about climbing, maybe fear, um, it, do you, just uh, think, well, it's not that bad. And um, <laughs> so climbing for me is a, um, it's sort of my balancing point. I'm a hyperactive, high strung, um, motivated person. I'm not gonna put it in, a, in some way, but being, when I'm climbing, I have to be in the moment and I'm hyper situationally aware. So all the data that's out there is 
screaming for my attention. So second grade was absolute misery. I was a problem child. <laughs> but when I go climbing, then I'm like, oh, all of a sudden you don't, yeah. Everything else that's there, you have to be in the moment. And I think that's one of the benefits that climbing does. And when you do that in conjunction with another person, then you're really, um, you, you form a bond. And that's a fundamentally great thing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shelly, for coming out here. We've got uh, books. We've got pre-signed posters. Thank you so much. Make friends. Shelly's got something for us here. Hey, everybody. We have a few more of Conrad's Everest book up at the cash register. Um, there are only about oh, maybe 20 left. So if you'd like to have a personalized signed book by Conrad, you can go to the cash register. He's going to be at a table up at the front signing books that you might have already in your possession. So get ready to queue up. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good evening. Yeah.